Hi there, welcome back. Today we will be doing a past year walkthrough of Cambridge International AS and A Level Paper 1 Theory Fundamentals for the October slash November 2022 9618 slash 11 exam series. For this walkthrough, you will need 2022 October slash November 9618 slash 11 question paper as well as 2022 October slash November 9618 slash 11 mark scheme. So you can download the question paper as well as the mark scheme just by doing a basic Google search or you can use my link in the description to download both the question paper as well as the mark scheme. If you use my link, you'll come to this page and then you can just download this 222 underscore October underscore November underscore 9618 underscore 11 dot PDF. You can just download this file here and then download the mark scheme from this file here. So this is the mark scheme here. Answer underscore 222 October November 9618 dot PDF. So you can just download these two files here or you can just click on this button this download button here to download everything into your computer. So you download all the question paper and the mask into your computer. So without further delay, let's look at question one. Let's start with one AI. Convert the unsigned binary integer into binary. 0010011. So how do you convert this unsigned binary integer into binary? The keyword for this question here is unsigned. It means that this last digit here, this 2 to the power of 7 here, is actually a positive number. Therefore, it's an unsigned binary integer. And now let's look at the working. So this is a one mark question. So how do you do that? So you can just do like this. So first of all, you'll get 2 to the power of 0, plus 2 to the power of 1, plus 2 to the power of 2, plus 2 to the power of 5. Because this is like 2 to the power of 0 here, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, and 2 to the power of 5. So what you're doing here is that you are just summing all the numbers together. And then you'll get this 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 32. And then you'll get the final answer. Definitely for this question, you don't have to show the full working as what I show in the screen here. You can just show 39 here and you will still be able to get one mark here. And next, convert the binary coded decimal BCD into binary. So for BCD, it's actually quite simple. You can just split them into two. So you can split them into 0010, 01111. And you can convert this green and blue into respective digit, which is 2 to the power of 1 for 0010, and then 2 to the power of 0, plus 2 to the power of 1, plus 2 to the power of 2 for this blue color here. And then it will be 2, and then 1 plus 2 plus 4 for the blue. So the final answer will be 27. Therefore, 27 is the final answer for this BCD question here. And next, convert the 8-bit 2's complement binary integer into binary. So how do you do this? So this is a keyword here, 2's complement and 8-bit. It means that this 2 to the power of 7 here is actually a negative number. And now let's look at the working. So the working will be 2 to the power of 0, plus 2 to the power of 1, plus 2 to the power of 2, plus 2 to the power of 5, plus 2 to the power of 6, plus negative 2 to the power of 7 because this is a 2's complement binary integer. So the next working is 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 32 plus 64 minus 128. So the final answer will be negative 25. Therefore, this is how you can convert a 2's complement binary integer into binary. The next question is perform the following binary subtraction and then show your working. So this number here is subtracting this number here. So what we can do here is that 1011001 minus 0111 is equal to 101001 plus bracket negative 0111. It means that we want to convert this number into a tools complement representation. And how do you do that? So the next working will be 101001 plus 1000011. So how do you get into this blue form here? So to get to this blue form, you are converting this number into two's complement. So to do that is you will just reverse bits plus one. So first of all, you reverse all the bits here. So you will get 1000110 plus 0001 because you have to plus one to get the full two's complement form. So this is the one's complement form. And then the final answer here will be two's complement form. So this is how you can get into this blue form here. And then we will just show the working in vertical form. So we are doing a addition instead of a subtraction now. So the full working will be something like this. So this is the first number here, the second number here. This is the answer and then this is the carry row. So the working will be one plus one is equal to zero with a carry of one here. And then one plus one is equal to zero with a carry of one. But we have to plus one from the previous carry. So the answer here will be one here. So one with a carry of one and then zero plus zero is equal to zero. And then we just add the one here. So this is equal to one and then zero one is equal to one here. And then one zero is equal to one here. And then one zero is equal to one here. Zero zero is equal to zero here. And then one one is equal to zero here with a carry of one. So we can just ignore this carry here. Therefore, the final answer will be zero zero one one. 1110. One, one, so this is how we can do the 
binary subtraction. Normally, you will convert the second number into two's complement form, and then you will just sum the first number and the second number to get the final answer. Next, give one similarity and two differences between the ASCII and Unicode character sets. So this question is quite straightforward. So for the similarity, you can just put both represent each character using unique code. It means that for both ASCII and Unicode, we always use unique code to actually represent each character. And the first difference between them will be Unicode can go up to 32 bits per character, whereas ASCII is either 7 or 8 bits. So if it's an extended ASCII, it will be 8 bits. But if it's a normal ASCII, it will be just 7 bits. And then Unicode can represent a wider range of characters than ASCII. So this is the difference one. And then for difference two, it will be different languages are represented using Unicode, whereas ASCII is only for one language. So as we know, ASCII is always designed based on a country, but for Unicode, it can be used for all countries. Next, sound samples are recorded and saved in a file. State what is meant by sampling rate. So for sampling rate, it's just a definition. So the definition would be the number of samples taken per unit time. Explain the effect of increasing the sampling resolution on the sound file. So by increasing the sampling resolution, what you do here is that you are just increasing the number of bits per sample. It means that let's say one sample is like 3 bits, you increase from 3 bits to 4 bits, 5 bits, 6 bits and etc. And the effect of increasing number of bits per sample will be increase the file size. Therefore, this is a 2 marks question. So increasing number of bits for one mark and then file size increases for the other mark. And now let's look at question 2. So for question 2, draw one line from each security feature to its most appropriate description. So this is a security feature and then this is a description. So what is firewall? Firewall is used to accept or reject incoming and outgoing packets based on criteria. And next, what is farming? Farming is redirects a user to a fake website. And next will be antivirus software, which scans file on the hard drive for malicious software. And finally will be encryption. So what is encryption? Encryption is converting data to an alternative form. So if you look closely, for every question, I have a label beside the total marks here. So for example, this is C6. It means that this question is actually from chapter 6. So for this past year walkthrough, I will be putting the chapter number beside the total marks for every question just to let you know that this question is from which chapter. Next will be question 3. So for this question, draw a logic circuit for the logic expression. So for this type of question, normally what I do here is that I will convert it into equation form from the verbal form. So the equation form will be this equation form here. So first of all, not A and not B in this bracket here, it means that a inverse dot B inverse. So this is for not A and not B. And then we put a bracket here. Since this is N, therefore we use a dot here. And next will be all. So we will put plus here. And next will be not B and not C. Therefore, B inverse dot. This is for N gate. And then C inverse and then bracket. And finally will be not the whole thing. It means that I will be noting this whole equation here. So what I do here is that I will just put a bracket here. And I will just inverse the whole equation. So this is the first step that I normally do when I do this type of logic expression. I always convert this into equation form so that it's easier to see. Definitely for your side, you can just stick with this form. You don't really have to convert into this equation form. Instead that for me, I prefer to convert to equation form so that it's easier to compute the whole logic circuit. And now let's look at how can we draw the logic circuit. So I will be using my iPad to draw out the logic circuit. So let's just start together. So first of all, I will start with A and B first. So not A and not B, it means that I have to inverse this A and B using a NOT gate. So first of all, I will just draw a straight line here. And I will be just drawing a NOT gate here. So this is for NOT A. And then for NOT B, it's the same thing here. So I'm just going to draw this. And then be doing a NOT gate here. And then we'll be just completing the line here. Yeah, I forgot to complete the line at the top here. Okay, so this is for not A and not B. And then the next thing that I'm going to do here is that I'm going to draw this end here. So I'm just going to draw an end gate here. So I'm just going to draw an end gate here. And then we'll be drawing the uh, not B and not C here. So let's draw this. So not C here. Okay. And then this is also an end gate here. So we'll be drawing this C into an end gate here as well. We will be doing a branching into this end gate as well. Okay, maybe I should draw it better. Let me see how I can improve it. So I'm just gonna erase here. 
and then maybe I just draw the C a bit lower here and then just draw it this way okay so this is for not B and not C and then next will be this all gate here it means that right now we will be combining this not A and not B and not B and not C into an all gate here so we'll be just drawing drawing an all gate here so this all gate will be somewhere here and then we just drawing this output into this and then this output into this it looks a bit messy now but you know can always tidy up later and then finally it will be this not gate here so how do you draw this not gate here so it's quite easy you can just take this output here and then you can just draw the not gate here and then finally you just go to x here okay so this is how you can draw the full logic circuit so let's just go through together again so first of all i have this not a and not b and then they'll go through a and gate here so this is the end gate here and then not b and not c so not b one input from here and then not c so the c will go through a not gate here and then go through an end gate as well so we have done this not b and not c as well and then both of these input will go to this all gate here so this is the all gate here and then finally we have to not the whole input so it means that this is the not gate here and then finally we'll just tie it up to x here next will be complete the truth table for the logic expression so this is the same logic expression from the previous question and then i have copied the properly drawn diagram to the right here so this is the proper diagram based on question a there so for this type of question normally what i do here is that i will use intermediate stage method so how to do that is that I will just label out all the intermediate states. So let's look at the intermediate stages first. So first of all, we have D here, and then we have E here, and then we have F here, and then we have G here, and then we have H here, and then finally we have I here. So this is just a random alphabet that I use. You can use any alphabet, just that for now, I just prefer to start from D. So D coming out from not A, and then E from not B, and etc. And then in the working space here, I'm just going to compute an intermediate table based on this intermediate stages here. So the table will look something like this. And now let's go through together. So for D here is actually the inverse of A. So A is 0, therefore D is 1 here. And then for E is going to be 1 because this is 0. And then for F is 1 and 1 to the end gate. So it's going to be 1 here. And then for G is the inverse of C. So it's going to be 1 here. And then for H is going to be e and g as an input so e is one and g is one so one and one for n gate h is gonna be one and then finally for i here the input will be f and h so one and one the output is gonna be one since this is a all gate and next for x x is a not gate of i so the output will be zero here so this is how we can compute the intermediate table based on the inputs so d so it's going to be inverse of a so it's one and then e is going to be inverse of b so it's going to be one and then f is going to be one and one to an end gate so it's going to be one and then g is the inverse of c so it's going to be zero h is going to be the output of e and g so this is going to be zero here since it's an end gate and then i is going to be an all gate of f and h so it's one zero and then one here and then x is going to be inverse of one so it's going to be zero here next will be one for d and then e since this is one here so this is going to be zero here and then for f is going to be zero and then for g is going to be one and then for h is going to be zero and then for i is going to be zero and then for x is the inverse of zero so it's going to be one here and then i will just go through the remaining rows in a very fast pace so you can just pause the video and look at the final answer so it's going to be one and then zero 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 and then one and then what zero and then one and then zero and then one and then one and then one and then zero and then next will be zero and then one and then zero and then zero and then zero and then zero and then next will be one here since this is the inverse of zero and next will be zero and then zero and then zero and then one and then zero and then zero and then the output will be inverse of zero so it's going to be one here and the final will be zero and then zero and then zero and then zero 
and then zero and then zero and then the output is going to be inverse of zero therefore the output is going to be one therefore the final answer will be zero zero one one zero one 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 so this is how you can use intermediate table to complete the truth table and next let's go to question four so for question four this is a chapter eight question so i won't be going through the question line by line you can just pause the video and read the question so let's start with question a complete the entity relationship er diagram for the database photographs so for this question here what we need to do is that we want to determine whether this is a one to many relationships or many to one relationships or even one to one relationships and now let's look at the answer so let's start with this customer and party so the first question that you ask yourself is can a customer go to many parties the answer is yes therefore the answer will be one to many so one customer can go to many party and next will be party and photo data so let me ask you can a party has many photo data the answer is yes therefore this is a one to many relationships and next will be can a camera has many photo the answer will be yes therefore this is a one to many from camera to photo and finally how about customer and camera data if you look at this there's no direct relationship between customer and camera data so we can just leave it blank therefore for this answer the answer will be this customer to party one to many party to follow data one to many camera to follow data one to many definitely what we went through just now is just using common sense but let's look at the answer based on the table schema so if you look at this customer and party table let's look at this customer table and then party table if you look at this this customer id here is actually the foreign key in the party it means that this party can have many different customer id therefore this is a one to many relationship and next it will be party and photo data so if you look at this photo data table here so we have this party id as a foreign key here it means that for this photo data table we have many party id as a foreign key therefore this is a one to many and finally will be camera data and photo data so look at this photo data here we also have camera id as the foreign key so it means that this photo data table here we can have many camera id therefore this is a one to many and finally let's look at customer and camera data so if you look at this this camera data table here it doesn't have any information related to customer and this customer table it doesn't have any information related to camera data therefore they have no relationship between each other so this is how we normally answer the question related to er diagram normally i'll ask my students to actually think in terms of common sense first and then we'll just use the table schema to double check the answer and then for b the database is normalized and is in third normal form describe the characteristics of a database that is in third normal form so this is just a definition question so it's actually quite simple so the first one will be no repeating group of attributes so this is for one and f then next will be no partial key dependency so this is for two and f and then finally no non-key dependency so this is for three and f so this is how you can answer this question they are just asking for the definition of three and f and then for C, the table shows some sample data for the table photo data. State what is meant by a tuple. Give an example of a tuple from photo data. So this is a definition question for tuple. So what is a tuple? A tuple is a single row in the table. So this first row here is a tuple, second row is a tuple, and etc. So the example will be this one here. So ST23-56 as photo ID. BD987S party ID and then 0834S time taken and then NIK02S camera ID. So this is the example of a tuple. We are just picking any row from this table as the example. And next, complete the structure query language script to display the total number of photographs that have been taken using a camera with a camera ID starting with 10. For this question, they are just asking us to count the total number of photographs therefore we can just use the count function therefore select count and what do you count you are counting the photograph therefore the column name will be photo id and then what is the table name the table name is here photo underscore data therefore from photo underscore data and next where camera id like since this question is asking for can so we can just put this as the answer therefore open quotation c a n percentage it means that it can be anything after can and then we'll just close the quotation so you can use percentage or use star it doesn't matter it's just that i prefer to use percent so this is the final answer select count bracket photo id 
from photo underscore data where camera ID light, open quotation, can, percentage, closing quotation, and then semicolon here. So this is the four marks question from chapter eight. The last question for question four will be, write an SQL script to include two new fields in camera underscore data to store the number of photographs currently on the camera and the date the camera was last used. So this is adding new fields into camera data table. So first of all, we can write author table camera underscore data since we want to add column into this table here. Therefore, we have to use the author table command and then we can just write add number store integer. So this is to store the number of photographs and this is the integer data type. And next will be comma last use. So this is the column name for the date the camera was last used. And then the data type will be date data type and then semicolon. So this is how you can get three marks for this question itself. So if you're enjoying the past year walkthrough so far, definitely give this video a thumbs up to help with the YouTube algorithm to help more students like you. Furthermore, if you're interested to learn more topics from paper one, you can go to my YouTube channel homepage, which is youtube.com slash at School to look at the video playlist that I split by chapters for paper one. And if you want to learn more, you can check out my paper one crash course at www.hagwin.school. And now let's proceed to question five. State what is meant by the store program concept in the one human model of a computer system. And the answer will be instructions and data are stored in the same memory space. And next, a central processing unit CPU contains several special purpose register and other components. State the role of the following register. So what does a PC do? A PC is used to store the address of the next instruction to be fetched. And next will be index register. Index register is used to store a value that's added to an address to give another address. So it means that inside this index register, there's always a number one, two, three, four, and then we'll use another address number to add up this index register to get the final address number. And next will be status register. So status register is used to store flags, which are set by events. So there are actually four flags, which are carry flags, overflow flags, negative flags, as well as zero flags. So I actually talk more about these flags in the crash course video. Next will be take one box in each row to identify the system bus used by each CPU component. So system clock actually uses control bus, whereas memory address register actually uses address bus. Next question is, describe the purpose of the control unit in a CPU. So the purpose of the CPU will be to manage the execution of instruction in sequence. And next will be to control the communication between the components of the CPU. Since this is a two marks question, therefore we need to write at least two points for this question. And next will be describe the purpose of an interrupt in a computer system. So the purpose will be to send a signal from a device or process. And this is a two marks question. So we need to write at least two points. So we can write, why do we send a signal? This is to seek the attention of the processor. And next will be identify two causes of a software interrupt. So the keyword for this question will be software interrupt. So we can write the typical use case, which is unable to execute program due to missing file. I'm pretty sure that you have encountered this in your PC before, whereby you try to run a program and then a prompt came out and telling you that it's unable to execute the program due to missing file. So just always remember that example. And next example will be division by zero error. It means that you are trying to divide a number by zero. So you return error as well. And now let's look at question six. The current contents of main memory and selected values from the ASCII character set are given. Trace the program currently in memory using the trace table. So I have put the instruction and the explanation on the right. So that's easier for us to do the program tracing. And now let's trace the program together. So we have the initial value of 0, 0, 66, 65, and 35 for all these memory addresses. So we'll start the first row from address 77. So let's look at this. So I write 77 here. So 77 here. And then the first instruction is LDR hash zero. So what does LDR stand for? LDR stands for immediate addressing, load the number N to IX. It means that we are loading the number zero to the index register. Therefore, the value of index register is gonna be zero here. And next, 
LDX110. So what's LDX? LDX is index addressing. It means that I'm going to add the address 110 plus 0 as the final address. So what is inside 110 is actually 66. Therefore, for address 78, we will load the value of 110 here, which is 66, into the ACC. So let's let's write the value into the ACC. So it's going to be 66 here. And next is going to be CMP hash 35. It means that we are actually comparing the value of ACC with number 35. So the ACC is 66 and we are comparing with 35. So no changes. So we can just write 79 here without writing anything else in that particular row. And next will be JPE 92. It means that we'll jump to address 92 if the comparison was true. So the comparison was false. So we can just write 80 here without doing anything. And since it was false, we'll just go to the next address, which is 81. So it will be 81 here. And then ADD 100. So what is ADD? ADD is add the contents of the given address to the ACC. So what is inside 100? 100 here is actually content 0 here. Therefore, the value of ACC remain as 66. So no changes. So we don't have to write anything in that row because there's no changes to the value of ACC. And next will be 82. So let me write 82 here first. So 82 is STO101. It means that you're actually storing the value of ACC into address 101. So what is the value of ACC? It's actually 66. So we will be storing 66 into address 101. So let me see. So 101 here and then we will just write 66 here. And next is LDM hash 1. So what is LDM? LDM is immediate addressing. It means that we're loading the number N to ACC. So the number N is 1 for this case. So for 83, so you can write 83 here. And then the ACC value is going to be 1 here since we are loading this number into ACC. So 83 is going to be 1 here. And then we go to 84. So 84 is ADD 100. So we are actually adding the content of the address 100 to the ACC. So 1, what is in 100? 100 is actually still 0. Therefore, 1 plus 0 is still equal to 1. So no changes. We can just skip that value. And then we go to 85. 85 is STO100. Means that we are actually storing the content of ACC into address 100. So address 100 will have the value of 1 here. So let me check the address 100 and then we can just write 1 here. And next will be INCIX for address 86. So it means that we're actually increasing by 1 for index register. So we just write 86 here. And what was the original value of IX? It was 0. So 0 increased by 1 is going to be 1 here. So I'm just going to update the value of IX into 1 here. And next will be LDX110. So what does it mean? It means that we'll use address 110 plus the content of the index register, which is 1 in this use case. So what is in 111? It's actually 65 here. So 87. And then we're going to update the ACC value to 65 here. So I'm just going to write ACC to 65 here. And next, CMP35. It means that we are comparing the content of ACC with the value of 35. So ADA will be just blank for this row. And next it will be JPN81. It means that we'll jump to address 81 if the comparison was false. So for 88 here, this comparison was actually false. So after 89, we won't go to 90. We'll jump back to 81 here. So let me just write it down first. So 89. So this is JPE. So this row will be blank. And the next row is going to be 81. So let me just write 81 here first. Okay. So let's go back to 81 again. So for 81 is ADD 100. It means that we'll add the value of address 100 into ACC. So for 100, the latest value is actually 1 here. And then the ACC value is actually 65 here. So 65 plus 1 is actually equal to 66. So we're going to update the value of ACC to 66. So 81 is going to be 66 here. And then 82, STO101, it means that we will store the value of ACC into address 101. So 82 here. 
and now let's look at the current value of address 101 it's actually 66 here so it means that there's no change so we can just leave the row blank and then we go to 83 so let me just write the address 83 here first and then ldm hash 1 it means that we are loading the value of 1 into acc so i'm just going to update the value of acc from 66 to 1 and then we go to 84 here 84 here is add 100 and the current value of 100 is going to be 1 here so 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 so 84 is equal to 2 here and then 85 sd 100 means that i'm going to store this 2 into address 100 so 85 here and address 100 is going to be updated into value 2 here and then next will be 86 incix means i increase the index register by one so 86 here and then what is the value of index register now is one so it's going to be two now and then you'll be 87 87 is going to be ldx 110 so the current value of index register is two so two plus 110 is actually 112 so what's the value in 112 it's actually this 35 here so we're going to load this 35 into acc so for 87 it's going to be 35 here and then it will be cmp 35 so for address 88 we'll just leave it blank for this row so 88 and then we'll leave the other values blank since this is just a comparison and next will be jpn 81 it means that you only jump to 81 if it's not equal but right now acc is actually 35 so 35 is actually equal to 35 so for address 89 we can just leave it blank as well so we just write 89 with a blank row and then we'll go to 90 here so for 90 it's gonna be ldd 100 which means loading the content of a location at the given address to acc so what is inside the address 100 it's gonna be value 2 here so for 90 it's gonna be acc goes into 2 and then for the next address it's gonna be 91 so add hash 48 it means that we're adding the value of 48 into acc so 2 plus 48 is actually equal to 50 so 91 and then the value of acc is gonna be 50 here and then for 92 is out so what is out out is output to the screen the character whose ascii value is stored in acc so let's look at this table here so for 50 the character is going to be 2 at the output so what we do for address 92 is going to be 2 at the output so let me just write it down here so 92 and then for out is going to be 2 based on the value of 50 and finally it's going to be 93 here which is n so n is return control to the operating system so we can just write 93 and then we can just leave the row blank so this is how we can trace a program using a trace table now let's look at the next question the following instructions are repeated for your reference state the purpose of this part of an assembly language program so this is quite a tricky question but no worries let me teach you how we can do this question so first of all we'll just build a dummy table with some dummy value here so we'll put acc here and then address 100 address 101 and address 165 so you might be asking why these three addresses because for this instruction we have address 100 165 and 101 so i just put some random value 333 as the initial value of 100 and then 444 as the initial value of 101 definitely i can put some value for address 165 as well but for this example sake i will just leave it empty and now let's do this instruction together so first of all ldd 100 so when you run ldd 100 what happened is that at acc we're going to get value 333 because we are loading the content of address 100 to acc and next sto 165 so when you run sto 165 what happened is at 165 we will store the value of acc so 333 at address 165 and next will be ldd 101 so acc has the value of 444 and next is sto 100 so now the value of 333 has been updated to 444 and next will be ldd 165 so when you run this instruction what happened is that the acc value will be updated to the value of 165 so it's going to be 333 and finally sto 101 so sto 101 will update the value of 101 from 
444-2333. I hope by now you can guess what does this set of assembly instructions actually do. So the answer will be swap the contents of memory address 100 and 101. So if you look at this, the initial value of 100 is 333 and now is 444 and the initial value of 101 is 444 and now the latest value is 333 therefore you are just swapping the content of address 100 and 101 for this use case and the next question is the current contents of the ACC are 100100011 show the result after the execution of the following instruction so saw binary 00011111 you are just doing a saw operation of this number to this both number so i put this number at the top here and now let's do the saw operation together so first of all 01 is equal to 1 here 00 is equal to 0 here 00 is equal to 0 11 is equal to 0 10 is equal to 1 10 is equal to 1 11 is equal to 0 and 11 is equal to 0 the next question is the same thing just that instead of using a saw operation we are using an operation and now let's look at the operation so first of all i have put the number at the top as well so these are the numbers and now let's do the n operation together so 1 1 is equal to 1 and then 1 0 is equal to 0 1 0 is equal to 0 1 1 is equal to 1 0 0 is equal to 0 0 0 is equal to 0 0 1 is equal to 0 and then 0 1 is equal to 0 therefore this is the answer for this question here the next question is all operations so i put the number at the top here and now let's do together so 1 1 is equal to 1 and then 1 0 is equal to 1 0 0 equal to 0 0 1 equal to 1 1 0 equal to 1 1 0 equal to 1 0 1 equal to 1 0 1 equal to 1 so this is the answer here and then the last question is logical shift right by two places you are just removing this two one on the right here so basically you are just shifting the number to the right by two spaces so let's look at the working so the working will be i will move this zero all the way to the right most bit first and then we we'll just follow with other bits so let's look at this so zero and then zero and then one and then zero and then zero and then one and then for the remaining bits i will just replace with zero so zero and zero so this is the answer for logical shift right next take one or more boxes in each row to indicate whether the task is performed in the first pass or the second pass of a two pass assembler so let's look at the first pass first so does first pass remove comments the answer is yes therefore a tick here does first pass read the assembly language program one line at a time it does for both first pass as well as second pass so it's a tick as well does it generate the object code so the answer is no it doesn't generate the object code in the first pass so we just skip this row here and then does it check the op code is in the instruction set yes it does therefore this is a tick as well then for second pass does it remove command no so we just skip this row does it read the assembly language program one line at a time yes it's a yes therefore it's a tick and next does second pass generate the object code the answer is yes therefore it's a tick here and then does second pass check the op code is in the instruction set no because this task has been done in first pass therefore we'll just skip this row here therefore this is the answer for c and now let's go to question 7. State two benefits to a programmer of using dynamic link library DLL files. So the major benefits of DLL files would be this one here. No need to recompile the main program when changes are made to DLL because changes to DLL file code are done independently of the main program. So this is the major benefits of using DLL file. And the next benefit will be this one here. Executable file size is smaller because the executable does not contain all library routines. And next, memory management is one of the tasks performed by an operating system. Describe the ways in which memory management organizes and allocates random access memory RAM. So this question is about memory management. So the first one will be dynamic allocation of RAM to programs. It means that you allocate memory based on how much each program needs. And next will be prevents two programs occupying same area of RAM at the same time. Definitely you can write more, but for this question, it's actually a two marks question. So we just write two points here. 
An operating system may include a utility program to compress text files. Describe one appropriate method of compressing a text file. So this is actually related to chapter 1. And the answer will be lossless compression using run length encoding. And since this is a 3 marks question, so we have to fully describe what run length encoding is. So next, whereby repeated sequence of characters are replaced by a single copy of the character and a counter of the number of characters. So this is run length encoding. Next will be explain the reason why increasing the amount of cache memory can improve the performance of a CPU. So basically, cache stores frequently use instructions and then more cache means more instruction can be transferred faster. Next will be state the name of a peripheral device port that provides a physical connection in the computer for each of these peripherals. So for 3D printer, we can just write USB port. And for monitor, we can just write HDMI port or VGA port. And now let's look at question 8. A local area network LAN uses a bus topology. Describe how a courier sends multiple access or collision detection CSMA slash CD is used in a bus network. So this is actually a quite straightforward question. We just have to write all the key points for CSMA slash CD. So the first key point will be before transmitting, a device checks if the channel is busy and data will be sent when the channel is free. And next will be since there's usually more than one computer connected to same transmission medium, two workstations can start to transmit at the same time causing a collision. Therefore, the purpose of this CSMA slash CD is to detect collision and also avoid collision. So the next point will be if a collision is detected, the workstations send a jamming signal and a board transmission. And finally, each of them will wait for a random amount of time before attempting to resend. So these are actually the four key points here to actually score four marks here. And now let's look at the last question, which is question 9. Many modern televisions are example of embedded systems. Explain why these televisions are embedded systems. The first explanation will be the embedded system is built into the TV and then combination of hardware and software designed for a specific function. So this is the core purpose of embedded system. The next question is embedded systems use electrically erasable programmable ROM, which is EEP ROM, Describe one benefit of using EEP ROMs in an embedded system. And this is a two marks question asking for one benefit. So we can describe one benefit and further elaborate on the benefits. So the major benefit of EEP ROM would be can be erased and reprogrammed several times. And to further elaborate would be this is so that firmware can be updated. So I hope you enjoyed this partial walkthrough and I highly recommend you to check out my paper one crash course preview here. Thank you and I will see you again then. Bye-bye.